Thank you very much for joining the United Youth Movement and hosting Ben Swan tonight. Uh, before I start, I would, like to, I would like for you all to please give a round of applause to UIM members who made this event possible. I'd also like to thank UMD's Rising Young Americans for Liberty chapter for co-sponsoring this event. Shouts out to Michael. Just to tell you a little bit about us, UIM is an organization that aims to facilitate societal and political discourse that's largely ignored by mainstream institutions such as the media and this very university. As you know, our nation is facing multiple crises. Our fiscal policy hangs in the balance as our so-called representatives can't agree on a budget, let alone a balanced one. Our civil liberties are being eroded and our incarceration rates are higher than any other in the world. In light of these problems, the American people have remained dormant. Why is this, must we ask? Why aren't citizens of the world's most democratic society mobilizing against these transgressions? Is it possible that the mainstream media is one of the causes of apathy in our nation's people? Is it possible that the controversy akin to Miley Cyrus's VMA appearance are largely insignificant when considering the great weight of responsibility we must bear as citizens of the most powerful nation? Is it possible that the monopoly media conglomerates hold over 90% of American media directly affects the state of affairs and how the public reacts to them? As a good friend of mine used to say, media is the unofficial fourth branch of government. And ladies and gentlemen, genuine investigative journalism by way of the media is an integral part of our democracy. For a democratic republic to function properly, citizens must be cognizant of the most important issues and from there on formulate an opinion using their intellect and morals. For such a society to function this way, we need real investigative journalism. We need journalists like Mr. Ben Swan. Mr. Swan spent nearly 15 years working as a journalist. He has won two Emmy Awards and two Edward Murrow Awards. In 2010, Ben moved to Cincinnati, where he took a primetime anchor job and started his well-known segment, Reality Check. In 2012, he became the first journalist to confront President Obama directly in an interview about the constitutionality of his kill list. Without further ado, I bring you, ladies and gentlemen, Ben Swan. Well, two things. First of all, thank you, sir. You are my hero. Uh, and second of all, I want to have hair like that when I grow up. Isn't this hair awesome? Man, that's some good hair. Um, I, I'm really uh, excited to be with you all this evening and to just spend a few minutes just kind of chatting with you about what I see as an exciting time in America right now, uh, a great time to be in media, a great time to, if you have an interest in politics, uh, to be a part of, of political solutions. Um, but this is going to be kind of informal in that I'm going to be sharing some ideas, but I want to be able to talk with you guys about it. So, you know, as we go, if you have questions, if you have things you want to say, if you want to challenge me on things, oh, please challenge me on things. And I really want you to, because one of the things I really want is for us to be able to talk about things that break down what I call a left-right paradigm, okay? There is a left-right paradigm in media, and there is a left-right paradigm in politics, and it's a false paradigm. We're gonna talk about that a lot tonight. And one of the things we're gonna do is, is I hope to challenge some of kind of the preconceived ideas you have about that left versus right idea, okay? So we're gonna get into some of that. And like I said, it's gonna be pretty informal. So. I'll share ideas with you and some concepts with you, but I really do, I want to hear from you. Uh, I want to talk to you about some of these things. The first thing I want to share with you, though, is this logo, this image. Uh, and that is the hashtag that we use, liberty is rising. Because we believe that liberty, the, the idea of liberty being that individuals possess individual rights, that that is rising in America. And it's rising more so than it has in a very, very long time. That more and more people, regardless of what side of the political spectrum they fall on, whether they are labeled on the right or labeled on the left, 
that the individual is beginning to believe that maybe they do in fact have rights that really are inalienable to them, to their person. And the idea that rights were granted to them, either by God or by nature, it belongs to them. And the government doesn't have the right to take those rights. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, it doesn't take a lot of people to make significant change in the culture. It does not take many people. Samuel Adams once said this. He said, it takes not a majority to prevail, but an irate, tireless minority, keen on setting brush fires of freedom in the minds of men. He makes a good beer, so you can believe what that man has to say. Let's talk a little bit about this. Uh, liberty is rising. How many of you know the name Peter Schiff? Do you know that name? All right. I know who the libertarians in the room are. <laughs> You've given yourselves away. Let me just do a little poll real fast. How many of you do consider yourselves to be libertarians? Okay, that would be like a capital L libertarian. Okay. How many of you consider yourselves to be Democrats? Okay. How many of you Republicans? <laughs> There's like half of one. Okay, one Republican. And uh, the rest of you independents or not sure? Good. Good. Um, those of you who are independents, I hope to... to Help to shape some of that, that thinking tonight also. Because did you know that independents are the fastest growing section of the American political spectrum today? Did you know that? That more people are calling themselves independent than at any time in recent American history, modern American history. And not only that, but the so-called independent is actually reaching the point now where there are going to be as many quote-unquote independents as there are people who are registered voters in political parties. It's an incredible number, and it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Now, we can debate about why that is, and, and I have some theories on it, and part of it's because of the fact that we have a <clears throat> fake left-right paradigm that tells you there are only two real political parties in this country, a Republican Party and a Democratic Party, and that, of course, is untrue. Uh, we actually have a whole bunch of parties, and if we would allow all those parties to have voices in debates, Many Americans might not necessarily call themselves independents. They might call themselves something else. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But this guy, Peter Schiff, for those of you who don't know the name, he's, he's a big money guy. He's made a ton of money in his career. He's an economist. He's what you call an Austrian economist. How many of you know the term Austrian? So you know that? Okay. Uh, the rest of you who don't know that term are probably what we would call Keynesians. Um, and you don't even know you're a Keynesian, and we can tell you about that. Uh, but Peter Schiff is an Austrian, which basically means that he believes that the, in the economy there are highs and lows, and that's a natural thing, and that for every time you get a bubble, like the housing bubble, you guys are aware of the housing bubble in 2008 where everybody's like making tons of money on their houses, and you go out to buy a house, and the real estate agent tells you, oh yeah, you should buy this, it's a great investment, and everybody's telling your parents to buy, 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 because this, this thing's going to make you money, and then all of a sudden in 2008 the whole thing crashes, well, Austrian econ economics, and again, this is a real quick version, but Austrian economics essentially says, if you have a bubble, it will burst, okay? And so Keynesian, the other form of economic theory, says, no, that's not true. I mean, markets are always going to rise, and they're going to keep rising forever, and every time that the market bursts, the government fixes it for a little while until it rises some more. And so it's always going to keep going up. Austrian economics says that's not true, that every time you get a bubble, it's going to burst because that's what bubbles do. They burst, and eventually it'll come back down. So Peter Schiff is of that second group. He's a, he's a pretty smart guy. But he and I were talking one time, and he tells me, uh, Swan, why do you go around telling people that liberty is rising? Because he says liberty is not rising in America. He says liberty is dying in America. And here are some of the reasons why Peter Schiff, I think, is correct. We have things like the Patriot Act and the NSA. You guys familiar with the Patriot Act? Patriot Act, if you don't know more than just the, the title of it, is one of the most constitutionally, what did you say? What were you about to say? Devastating. devastating. Constitutionally devastating, that's a good word, uh, laws ever passed in this country. Uh, it, it, it took away more constitutional rights, not privileges, rights, than any other law that had ever been passed in America before it. It was in 2001. It continues to be renewed every single time it comes up. Uh, but it's, it's a bad law, and we can talk about that. We have things like the NSA spying on Americans, listening to phone calls, reading emails. You have policies like in New York, the stop and frisk policy. You familiar with stop and frisk? Essentially says that if police are walking down the street, they see an African-American young man, they say, hey, we need to frisk him because he's the wrong color, so we need to search him. They have the right to do so because it makes communities safer. The Constitution says you do not have the right to do that. 
It protects against unlawful searches and seizures, meaning you cannot just search someone because you think that their skin color is the wrong color. There's a thing that a lot of people have been, been making noise about recently. It's called um, the Constitution-Free Zone. Have you heard of this thing? There's talk of a Constitution-Free Zone within 100 miles of every part of the U.S. border. If you may draw a circle around the United States, just kind of trace it like if you were using a crayon when you were in school. 100 miles around any border, whether it be land border or uh, a water border, an oceanic border, regardless of where it is, that that is a constitution-free zone, which means that your right to unlawful search and seizure does not exist there. Your right to free speech does not exist there. These are laws where law, areas where law enforcement needs to be able to have flexibility. It's called a constitution-free zone. Now, I grew up in a place called El Paso, Texas. El Paso is on the border with Mexico. Like, literally, you can throw stuff across the border, okay? And if you grew up in El Paso like I did, what you would see, a little bit different than Maryland, what you would see is that if you decide you're going to leave El Paso, you're going to drive to the north, you're going to drive to the west, you're going to drive to the east. <clears throat> if you drive south, you go into Mexico. If you go any other direction, if you drive out of the city at all, you have to drive through a border patrol checkpoint. You have to. There's no other way around it. And when you go through that checkpoint, you are asked for papers. Prove that you're a U.S. citizen. And, and Border Patrol has the right to stop you and to question you, and they do so based upon your skin color. Because brown people could be coming from Mexico, and so we need to check and see if they're legal citizens or not. It is, so when they, we have a lot of people talking about this idea of a constitution-free zone, and they're like, this is a, oh my gosh, this is a, a terrible thing. How could we allow this to happen? I got news for them. I'm 35 years old, and... For at least 35 years, I can tell you that that constitution-free zone has existed already in the United States. For some reason now, people are talking about it. Uh, you have the Department of uh, Justice seizing journalist records because they're trying to decide whether or not the uh, journalist is reporting information that they don't think they should be reporting. You have drone strikes on U.S. citizens who were living overseas. You have the IRS targeting political groups. You have unconstitutional wars. You have the federal data hub. You have policing for profit. And I'm big on issues of policing for profit. Um, are you familiar with that term? Policing for profit essentially means this. If you're driving in your car, and I don't know if they do this here in Maryland or not, but if you're driving in your car and you go past what's called a speed camera, and that camera clocks you going too fast, you get a ticket in the mail. Any of you familiar with that? Okay. You have a lot of that here. Yeah, because but you, what you have to understand is the reason that happens is because they're trying to protect you and keep the city safe, right? <laughs> it's not what they're doing at all. It's called policing for profit, which means you create ways to find people, to fine people in order to generate revenue. So if I can set up a camera alongside a street and clock everybody who goes too fast past that camera and send you tickets in the mail and then you fill out your ticket and you send me a check for it, I can buy stuff as a municipality, okay? And then I call it public safety. But it's not public safety. So we have this in Ohio where I'm from, in, in near Cincinnati, we have, well not from where I'm living now, what, what we have is um, these police departments who will set up these big cameras in different spots and they clock people as they go past. Now, I don't know how it works in Maryland, but in Ohio, you have a point system on your license. You guys have that here? So if you get too many speeding tickets, what happens? They take away your license, right? That's right. But that's not why they don't do it. That's true. You guys recognize what they do. Now, if you just get caught speeding... Are they going to take away your license if you get caught too many times speeding by a cop who pulls you over? If you have a point system? Yes. It depends. Sometimes they'll do it in a way where you just have to pay a certain amount of money. And mm -hmm. if your license is still in your license, you just have to pay too much. Like I have to pay like $10 to get my license back. Mm -hmm. was, that a, was that being pulled over or being yeah, stopped? Over. Okay. Okay. So, don't have the money. So, the, so the point system is if you don't have the money, you're screwed. And if, and if the point system is set up that says, you know, if you are too much of a danger, we can't have you on the roads. Now, some of you guys pointed out, when you get stopped by those, those cameras that clock you as you go past, that doesn't go on your points. Why? Maybe. But in Ohio, the way it works is it's basically set up like a, it's, if they couldn't prove it was you, they shouldn't be making you pay anything for it. 
okay? If they can't prove that you were the one driving the vehicle, they're now saying, well, but, we, but you have to assume responsibility for it. Well, wait a minute. How do you, you can't make me assume responsibility if you don't know I'm doing it. The reason they, they set it up this way is because they don't want you to stop speeding. They have no desire for you to stop speeding. What they want is for you to keep driving past the camera too fast so they can keep clocking you so that you can keep getting tickets. It generates revenue. It sounds like what? Conspiracy. <laughs> Maybe so. But it's, I don't even think it's conspiratorial at all. I think it's just it's, it's good business. If I need to generate revenue through these cameras, I don't want to create a system that will prevent you from driving past them. So you can continue to get it. That's policing for profit. And it happens all over the country all the time. It's happening constantly. Um, and it's a huge problem. You have things like the drug war, which is a joke. You have the Federal Reserve Bank. You have CISPA. You have the, as I mentioned, Constitution-Free Zones. And you have NSA spying. And we'll talk more about the drug war tonight. I lived, as I told you, on the border. And I want to talk to you a lot about that because um, I, I know a lot of things about the drug war. And I can tell you that if it were about providing national security for this country, if our, if our nation was truly interested in providing security, you would legalize marijuana tomorrow. And the reason for that is because 70%, 70 percent, 70 percent of the bottom line of drug cartels is in marijuana. You take 70 percent out of the bottom line of any Fortune 500 company, what happens to them? Goodbye. They go bankrupt. They're done. But we don't do that. We keep this ongoing war because there's too much money wrapped up in it. Police departments, interestingly, 70% of the money that they receive in funding comes through drug programs, grants that are provided to law enforcement to fight the drug war. So why would law enforcement agencies ever want to end the drug war? They make a lot of money from it. Border Patrol, Customs, CBP, DHS, they make tons of money from it. Their revenue is, is a huge part of this so-called drug war. But if you were to turn around and said, you know what, let's, let's really make this about national security, you'd empty out the prisons, and that's no good because there's a lot of people making money from the prison system. You, you, would, you, would, you would disrupt the system that's been set up right now. So when we talk about the drug war, it's not a war at all. It's, it's really just a, it's a scam. So, let me skip past this for a second, if I can. Okay, so let's talk about the, the false left-right paradigm. <clears throat> we'll get more into that, those other details, and I, I want to hear from you guys. But what is the left-right paradigm? The left-right paradigm is an idea that Democrats and Republicans, those on the left and those on the right, are, are locked into this epic battle between good and evil. And if you're on the left, you're good. And if you're on the right, then you say, well, no, we're good, right? So you get to decide who's good and who's evil. But that's what the paradigm is, that it's our side against their side, and there's this kind of struggle between, between the left and the right to ultimately save the country. And the folks on the left will tell you that they're the ones who need to win in order for everything to be okay. And the guys on the right will tell you, no, we're the ones who have to win in order for everything to be okay. And every single day what you see in the news cycle and every day, day what you see in politics is the battle between the left and the right, the left-right paradigm. Essentially saying that when we talk about any issue, it all comes down to two things. It comes down to which side, the left side or the right side. Okay? That's what's happening in politics. So can somebody give me an example of something that's happening right now in politics that's a good example of the left versus right? You're already smiling. Come on. <laughs> give me something. The shutdown. Shut down. Great example of the left-right paradigm. So what does the left say? Republicans caused the shutdown. Okay? And what does the right say? Democrats caused this. Because, they, because why? They won't what? Negotiate. Well, negotiate. Wow, you guys are doing good on the talking points. That's excellent. That's excellent. So um, just to get your, your quick opinion on this, how many of you think that the shutdown needs to end? Okay? How many of you think that Republicans are the ones to end it? Should be. Yeah, they, they should be the ones to end it. Okay? How many of you think that President Obama should negotiate? Okay? <laughs> the rest of you say, <laughs> you get a hell no. <laughs> now listen, I'm, I'm with you. I, I, I disagree with the negotiation thing, and here's why. 
You need to shut down more of the government, <laughs> okay? Shut down some more. Not enough yet. Um, see, here's, here's a couple of issues. Number one is I agree with when the president says he is not going to negotiate, I agree with him because what we're talking about is a law that was legally passed by Congress, right? It was signed into law and it went to the Supreme Court. doesn't mean I have to agree with it. doesn't mean that I have to like it to agree with the concept of rule of law. If that is the process, then Congress needs to not say, wait a minute, oh, here's what we're going to do until, until you negotiate about the law. What Congress is not doing, and this is where the left-right paradigm comes into play, what Congress is doing is saying, and, and through the Senate and Ted Cruz and all these guys, what they're saying is, is we need to find a way to delay the law. We need to wait on the law. We need to find some, some common ground on the law. But it's, it's all BS. Because what they're really doing is essentially saying this. The guys on the left are saying, this is the law, we need to pass it. And they're right. And, and by the way, take any other issue, any other issue. Take an issue about guns. Take an issue about, about uh, the military and reverse roles. And say you have a Republican president and you have a Democratic House and a Republican Senate. And we ha just had that very recently. And you have a Democratic Senate saying, we're going to stop you from funding the military. They'd be going crazy on Capitol Hill. And Republicans would be going nuts saying, look at these obstructionists. They're, they're not following the Constitution. They're not following the laws. That's what they'd say. The problem that you have with this debate is, the real problem, is that you have both sides claiming all these different things about how Obamacare is bad, Obamacare does this, Obamacare does this. Listen, we can have a debate about how bad it is or how good it is. It doesn't matter how bad it is or how good it is. It really doesn't matter. The law was passed, so you put the law into action. Here's where Republicans are messing up. If you as a Republican think that you should find a way to deal with Obamacare, here's how you deal with it. Stop granting exceptions to people. That's the way you deal with it. You say, the law says that every American has to be signed up, so let's enforce the law. But Congress doesn't want to say that. You know why they don't want to say it? Because they exempted themselves from provisions. Because Congress, John Boehner, and Harry Reid, so you have the Speaker of the House, John Boehner, and you have the uh, Senate Majority Leader, Harry Reid, holding secretive meetings in the, during the summer, asking the President to meet with them to figure out a way to fix and create an exemption for members of Congress. Now, they never actually got their meeting, but these memos, and we wrote a, a story about this on benswan.com, two ends, you can check it out, that's my commercial. Um, we wrote an article about this, about the fact that, that Boehner and Reed were coming up with these crazy excuses saying, well, let's pretend we're going there to talk about immigration reform, because we can't let people know the real reason that we're going in here to have this meeting, because the real thing they wanted was to be able to say, exempt congressional staff to make sure that they're able to, because they're going to have to sign up for these exchanges, but they also get a taxpayer subsidy of anywhere from $7,500 to $12,000 a year for health care. We don't want to lose our subsidy. So when we see all this debate back and forth, all the fighting, all the arguing, what it really comes down to is political posturing. If Congress was actually interested in protecting you, they would say, if it's a bad law, then we'll all suffer under it together. And if it's a good law, we'll all thrive together. But it's not a law at all when you start granting exemptions and exceptions to everybody under the sun. That's the problem with the left-right paradigm. What nobody's telling you in mainstream media is that what's really happening between Republicans and Democrats right now is that neither of them are fighting to make the law even or fair. So it's all false. Here's the problem that we face in this country today, is that we have a founding document called the U.S. Constitution, okay? Now, some people like the Constitution and some people don't like it. I'm a big fan. And the reason I'm a fan of the Constitution is simply this, because rule of law does not discriminate. It does not play favorites. It does not give one person special privilege. Rule of law says, if it's okay for you, it's okay for me. If it's not okay for you, it's not okay for me, period. We're all even. We're all equal. The original document the founders and framers drafted was an idea that essentially that you as an individual are sovereign. So what you do with your body, what you put in your body, 
is your right. Ultimately, how you live your life is your right. But we, we get this problem with the left saying, well, I don't like that document, and, and we, need to, we need to rethink it. So they'll say things like, well, let's talk about the Second Amendment, for instance. The problem with the Second Amendment is that if the founders and framers had only known, had only known that there would be assault-style weapons in the future, they never would have created a Second Amendment. That's their argument. The right says, that's crazy. That's crazy talk. The founders and framers still would have, would have created the Second Amendment. You're wrong. There's no, no ambiguity, they say, in the Second Amendment. Then they turn around and they'll say, oh, that person's a terror suspect. You can't give him his Miranda rights. You've got to arrest him and hold him and question him. No allowing him to have a lawyer. You can't lawyer up. That's what they'll say on the right. That's what they say. And the reason you can't do that is because this person's too dangerous. And if only the founder and the framers could have imagined a time when we would have terrorism. Oh, they never, never would have created the Fourth Amendment that guarantees you due process rights. Never would have done that. And so this argument between the left and the right ultimately comes back to the same thing. That they stand with the Constitution when it is politically expedient. And they trash the Constitution when it's not. Yes. Yes, I do. I, th I think that if you, if you pick and choose, then, then what is the document? Either rule of law exists or it doesn't. And if you, now listen, the, there is a process by which you can remedy things if you don't agree with them. The, do, the, the Constitution is not unchangeable. You can change it, but you have to get agreement to change it. The problem is we don't believe in changing it anymore uh, through rule of law. We believe that we're just going to you know, reinterpret it. The other problem that we run into, and I'll get to real quick, but the other problem we run into, though, today is that when we talk about law, you have to understand something. When the Supreme Court rules on cases, did you know that they're supposed to rule on what? Tell me what they're supposed to rule on. Constitution. The constitutionality of a law. Okay? That's what they're supposed to rule on. How many of you know that the, the U.S. Supreme Court does not use the Constitution as a guide to determine the constitutionality of a law? They don't. They use precedent. That's correct. So any law that has been passed, any judgment or ruling by any court between today and when the Constitution was written has precedent over the actual Constitution itself. So when you go to school to study to become a constitutional lawyer, you don't study the Constitution. You study case law. That's part of the problem that we have right now. We don't believe that this document actually has value, that, that other rulings and that other precedent has greater value. What were you going to say, sir? Uh, I was just going to say that five out of four Supreme Court justices, you know, rule something constitutional or unconstitutional. I don't think, and they don't do it unanimously, uh, there's no law on the next one. I mean, for it to be five to four, you know, five say it's constitutional, four say it's not, then is there really law in America? Well, and, and again, it doesn't necessarily have to be unanimous. However, the other thing that we've done in this country is we've fallen into a mindset that says when the Supreme Court decides something, then it's absolute. And that's not true either. The Supreme Court can, can uh, agree with a law or say that a law is constitutional, and the people ultimately are the final decision maker on that issue. And if you don't believe me, there's a case called Dred Scott that once said that slavery was constitutional. But it's not. And so the people, and unfortunately through, through war and incredible loss of life, but ultimately slavery was ended in this country. But it wasn't because the Supreme Court was wise enough to end it. Supreme Court said it was fine. So who do lawmakers answer to? Well, here's part of the problem that we run into, and you guys are very close to Washington, D.C. I got to land in uh, Reagan Airport a little bit ago. It's just wonderful, isn't it? Uh, part of the problem is this, that you have this group of people that run things uh, in Washington. We call them the influence peddlers. There were 12,719 registered lobbyists working in Washington, D.C. in 2011, okay? Um, lobbying is a 3.3 billion, with a B, billion dollar business in D.C. Party bosses run the parties. They decide 
who was going to represent the voter. We learned a lot about that in 2012, especially on the Republican side. Republicans just blew up their own party uh, by, by trying to essentially rig elections to make sure they got the candidate they wanted because they believed that Mitt Romney was the guy who was going to be president. He best represented the party. And incredible things happened throughout that, that uh, 2012 primary, incredible things, where rules were changed in the middle of uh, primaries and caucuses, where during the actual conventions they were shut down because they didn't like the way that the conventions were going. The, the 2012 Republican National Convention in Tampa got virtually no national coverage on the things that mattered. The things that didn't matter, like the coronation of King Romney, that got plenty of coverage. But, but a convention is not supposed to be a coronation. And so what did not get covered, what you didn't see if you watched the news at all, was the fact that you had delegates from the state of Maine walk off the floor when the RNC refused to seat them because they didn't like who they were going to vote for. They walked out. Delegates from Texas walked out. Speaker of the House John Boehner read a scripted rule change, and somebody had the fortitude to record with a cell phone camera where you can actually see that he reads and changes the rules of the Republican Party to control who people get to vote for, and it's scripted where it says the eyes have it, and he reads the teleprompter. That's the kind of stuff that you didn't see uh, going on. But what we did see is, is party bosses in control. Lobbyists are in control. Special interest groups are in control. Focus groups are in control. Political consultants. It's all about shaping a message. It's all about creating this idea of what you want if you're on the right, what you want if you're on the left. How do we manipulate you? How do we control you? That's the bad news. Now, you want the good news? The good news is there is this awesome group of people who are supposed to be the ones to hold lawmakers accountable. They're wonderful. They're called the fourth estate. <laughs> Journalists in America, the, the role of a journalist is to hold those in power accountable. And so we have these terrific people who do that every day, right? That's what they do is hold them accountable. No, not so much. Unfortunately, what we've seen is the left-right paradigm in, am I, am I blocking you? You're missing some of them? There's some good-looking folks up here. Um, the left-right paradigm in politics is now the left-right paradigm in media. About 15 to 17 years ago, there was a, an upstart cable news channel that decided they had an idea of how to build a really good business. And so they started something called Fox News Channel. Fox News Channel was going to be fair and balanced, balanced news, okay? Um, and, I, and I agree with Fox that they are balanced, and here's why. Because Fox believes that there are only two views in the world. There is the right view and there's the left view. And so they're going to be the balance to a left view. I think they are. If there are only two views in the world, they are the right view. But there are not only two views in the world. There are many different views. There are not only two sides to a story. There are many different sides. There are more than just two paradigms through which you can view things, a left paradigm and a right paradigm. There are a lot of different paradigms. And then there's something called truth. But we're all missing that point. We're all missing it. Because media won't talk about truth. They talk about everything from the left-right perspective. So I'm going to ask you guys a couple questions about, uh, let me see what we got here. Well, we'll talk about this for a second. Um, essentially, what we're doing in media is we're playing the same game with the Constitution, okay? So right media, media on the right, if you watch Fox, then you know they rail all the time against things like reading Johar Sarnayev, the Boston bombing suspect, allowing him to have his Miranda rights read. Jon Stewart does a great riff on it, making fun of it, saying, you know, the Miranda rights are not like Beetlejuice. You don't have to say the name three times for it to be true for it to appear, for it to suddenly take place. Your Miranda rights belong to you, regardless of whether they're read to you or not. That's what makes it a right. Okay? But on the right, what they'll say is, no, 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 he, this guy doesn't have those rights because he's too dangerous. On the left, they do the same thing with, with privacy in the NSA, um, with the Second Amendment rights. So we got this, this debate back and forth, but they play the same game, which is that none of them stand up for rule of law, and none of the folks, whether on the left or the right of that paradigm, are really seeking for truth. They're seeking to best represent what their viewers want to hear. 
Here's the biggest secret in media. People go to media to watch them, not to be informed. And when you go turn on your TV, most of the time, you're not going there for someone to inform you about what's happening. You're going there for someone to validate the belief system you already hold. If you lean to that left side of that paradigm and you already have a feeling about what you think about ultimately what's going to happen with the shutdown and who should move and the president shouldn't negotiate, are you going to go to Fox to be informed about why the president should negotiate? No. I'm going to say they're a bunch of clowns, right? I'm not going over there. I'm going to go listen to someone smart who's going to tell me what I already know. That's what you're really doing. You're going there to find out, I want to hear what I want to hear. And we do it on the other side, too. If you want to hear how, you know what? Republicans are, are the last line of defense against Obamacare. The president is about to rob your babies of their milk and, and all the oxygen in their bodies. It's about to happen. Then I need to go to Sean Hannity because I know he's going to tell me that. I know he's going to tell me. He's going to tell me what I, what I already know. Not, not going to him because I'm, I'm like, Sean, I'm really on the fence here. And I need, I need someone to cut through all this for me. You're going to him because you know what he's going to tell you. And you want him to validate for you what you already believe. That's the game that's being played right now. Patrick Henry once said this. He said, guard with jealous attention the public liberty. Suspect everyone who approaches that jewel. Unfortunate, unfortunately, nothing will preserve it but downright force. And whenever you give up that force, you are inevitably ruined. Some people take that quote as meaning physical violence, but I don't. I think we have all kinds of force an ability to stand up for public liberty and to break through that paradigm. And one of the ways that we're able to do it is through uh, new media. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Questions as we've, as we've come along. What do you have? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and just to say a couple things there. Um, so when we talk about free market and we talk about, you know, you're talking about the relationship between government and business. And that's a, that's a huge issue that, again, media doesn't really talk about at all. Um, we call it by a name here in America today that's a pretty nice, like, warm name. We call it uh, crony capitalism. You guys know that term, crony capitalism? Um, the name it's actually known by uh, is a little harsher, and that name is fascism. Fa that's, what it, that's what fascism actually is. Um, now, you know, when you say the, the word fascism today, what's the first thought that comes to mind? Hitler. Hitler. And Nazis. Yeah. It's like, oh, you can't call people fascists because then you're calling them Nazis. No, no, you're not calling them Nazis. Nazis were fascists. Fascists weren't Nazis. You have it backwards, right? Mussolini was a fascist. Mussolini believed that the greatest form of government was when government and corporations worked together. He thought that was the greatest system on earth. And by the way, up until World War II, um, Mussolini was thought of pretty highly in the United States. They liked what he was doing over there. 
this great idea of, of government and corporations working together. Now, we have today in America uh, a growing fascist system. Using the term correctly, okay, we're not saying anyone's walking around with swastikas on. Using the term correctly, we have a growing fascist system, which means we have a system in the United States today where certain groups, corporations, and companies are given special privilege over others. Monsanto is one of them. Yeah, Monsanto is one of them. How many of you guys know that name, Monsanto, by the way? Good. And a lot of you do. That's good. Um, a great example, and by the way, there's a, a great report on this. If you go to benswan.com, two ends, that's the commercial. Um, we have a report specifically about Monsanto and the relationship that Monsanto has to government. It's a, not a good relationship. See, and here's one of the problems that you run into when we talk about these things. So whenever you start talking about government, people automatically start feeling like, well, are you attacking, which president are you talking about? Are you attacking my guy? Are you attacking Obama? Or are you attacking Bush? Because Bush was good. Obama's terrible, right? Or no, 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 Bush was bad. Bush was so terrible, but Obama's really good. We're not talking about the individual. See, systems within government are created and exist over very long periods of time. So what you actually find is that Aside from the figureheads in politics, okay, the people who, who get all the name recognition and all the glory, when you really look at like government agencies, that's where the real problems come from. Government agencies where you have directors who stay there for, for many, many years and continue a system of inappropriate relationship. So Monsanto is a great example of how you have a, a private company that has ties to guys who work within um, government agencies, and then those guys who are working in government agencies leave the public sector, and they go work privately for Monsanto. And then they come back from working for Monsanto, and they go back and work in, in, in the public agencies again. And all of a sudden, Monsanto's getting all kinds of special deals that are allowing it to continue to build its business. And then that person leaves again and comes back, and now I'll run Monsanto this time. And, now I'm leaving Monsanto and I'm going back into public service again. What you find is that over and over in, in a crony capitalist or fascist system, you allow certain people to work in government and in the private sector. And that has to change. We have to change the system that says you can just walk back and forth between these two, uh, these two entities. You can work for the government and then you can go back and work for somebody who, who uh, runs this company. In Cincinnati, I'll give you a quick example in Cincinnati of a very like micro, a microchasm of how that happens. We have the Cincinnati Bengals uh, who play there and the Cincinnati Reds, okay? I've only been there for about three years, but in the 2000s, early part of the 2000s, um, the guys who own the Bengals, the Brown family, and the guys who own the Reds said, we want new stadiums, Okay? And so we want publicly funded stadiums, or else we may just leave. We might just take our team someplace else. So the city gets around, well, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And the county comes in and says, you know what? We need to make a deal where we're going to give them the special, these awesome stadiums on special land right alongside the river, this great spot. They had been sharing a stadium before that. We don't want them to share a stadium because that's so like 1990s. Nobody does that anymore. So we need to have our own stadium. So they, 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 push through these, these uh, levies and, and tax increases and bonds and they sell them. We're going to make this agreement to make this happen. And then they, they create this deal for taxpayers. It'll be great. Everyone will love it. Well, the stadiums are beautiful. They're there today. They're absolutely beautiful. And when you drive into Cincinnati, the first time I ever drove in, I was like, this is the coolest thing ever because these stadiums are sitting like right on the river when you go across the bridge and you can actually like see down onto the field. I'm like, I bet people just stop here during games and like watch, right? It's, it's great. And then you find out that actually what's not great about them is that every single year the county is running a deficit because they can't afford to pay for the stadium. So they keep raising taxes on homeowners. And it's not like if you own a home you get a discount on your ticket even though you're paying for the stadium. And so you have these huge financial burdens. So after a short amount of time of being there, one of our guys who works with me, who worked with me at the time, it was a weather guy, says, you know what the big story about those stadiums is? What's that? He says, the guy who was on the county commission who put the deal together, the year after it was all done, left county commission and took a job for the Bengals. It should be illegal. Should it be illegal? 
I think so because because what you're doing is essentially you are colluding on some level with a private entity in order to to funnel taxpayer dollars to them. Because how do you prove that there was collusion? Maybe there wasn't collusion ahead of time. Maybe it was just a deal afterwards that said, hey, you know what? Great job. We love what you did. But either way, what you're doing is you're now, you've now put this albatross around taxpayers' necks where they're basically bought into a contract that they cannot get out of. They're forced to do things, insane things. Like, for instance, um, after a couple of seasons, they had to put in a brand new scoreboard, even though there was nothing wrong with the other one. Some publicly funded stadiums have deals where eventually stadiums have to create, uh, what's that thing in Star Wars they use? The, no, no, no. <laughs> that would help. <laughs> no, no, the, um, when Princess Leia appears, what's that called? A hologram. They have to, they have to, as part of their contracts, when hologram technology is good enough, install hologram machines into the stadiums. It's, it's, you're, you're putting taxpayers on the hook for these enormous uh, agreements financially, and then you as the guy who constructed that, you go to work for the entity. I can't prove there's collusion there, but it sure looks like there was. And even if there wasn't, even if there was no collusion ahead of time, it should not be legal for you having made the taxpayer dependent on or, or beholding to this entity now go in and financially profit from that entity. Because that's what we have in, in so many forms. I mean, if you look at everything that's happening in Washington, D.C. right now, that's what happens over and over. I mean, the reason we have a tax system that's so screwed up is because lobbyists for big corporations go in there and get new loopholes in taxation. And so, okay, well, now these guys don't have to pay taxes. So you get companies like GE who end up not paying taxes. Well, how is it that GE doesn't pay taxes? Well, they have really good tax attorneys. That's what people will say. They have good tax attorneys. They don't have good tax attorneys. They have good lobbyists who are writing tax code, and they're giving it to lawmakers who are signing it into law, and that benefits them and not you. And that's, and that's where the inappropriate stuff happens. Rule of law should mean that whatever deal you get, I get too. Doesn't mean that I get all the things you get, but we have equality of opportunity. Um, and we don't have that in our, in our society right now. Okay, you and then back here. Well, but, but the, the reason the lawmakers won't allow anyone to move is because then when come re-election time, they want to say, look at all the, the jobs I created and, and all the stuff that, that's, that's happening here. I mean, that's why we have this enormous military industrial complex, um, and no one's willing to cut anything when it comes to what they call defense. But it's not even defense. It's just this massive war machine that we built in the United States, and it's all over the world. And whenever you talk about cutting anything from it, anything at all, everybody freaks out. And by the way, one of the things the right does when it comes to that is they'll start saying, well, look at all the jobs we'll lose. To not build, like, drones to drone people in other countries. Well, well. And they're okay with it. Right. But they point out all the waste, like, oh, well, you're teaching a shrimp to run on a treadmill. That's a waste of money. But then they're okay with building a plane you're not going to fly. Yes, sir.
Okay, so it, it's it's a little bit complicated. Here's essentially how it works. So the healthcare exchanges are set up because essentially under under the Affordable Care Act, right? Uh, the idea is, is that everybody has to have health insurance. Now they understand not everyone's going to, and so they've actually built into this like budgeting for people who aren't who are going to get fined. For some people, it'll be cheaper just to take a fine. So in that respect, it won't fix anything because if those people still get hurt, they'll still go to the emergency room and got the same problem. Um, if you now, the statement that if you like your health care, you get to keep your health care is not entirely true. The reason it's not entirely true is because when I was working for the station I was working for, before I started working for myself, um, I didn't get to pick my health care. My employer picked my health care. We have an employer-based system in this country. So if an employer, like I think we did a report today, the Trader Joe's, for instance, says, you know what, actually, we're not going to provide health care anymore, which a lot of companies are doing. They're just saying we're not going to provide it. So go sign up for the exchange. Um, then you're on your own and you have to go sign up for the exchange. So I didn't get to keep it if I liked it because maybe I liked it, but my employer dropped it. So now I have to go sign up for it. Um, so you go and you sign up for the exchange. And once you're enrolled into the exchange, some people will pay out of pocket in order to be able to get their health insurance. Other people, though, will get a subsidy because they'll say, I can't afford it. And so they'll get a subsidy. If you get the subsidy, then you are subject to much more scrutiny in terms of what's going on in your home, what kind of food are you eating, what kind of food are your kids eating. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's built in there to say, you know, we have to monitor uh, what you're doing. And that's part of the problem with, with the system itself is that it's set up in such a way that essentially puts all of the burden on the individual um, and it puts very little burden on insurance companies. See, one of the problems with the Affordable Care Act is that it did not deal with the issue of insurance companies that gouge people. It just said every single person in America has to sign up for a private service provided through a private company because the government isn't going to provide insurance. Insurance companies will. So I go sign up for the exchange, I can get into that, but th that exchange is going to help me find insurance that fits me through a private company. So a lot of insurance companies are going to make a ton of money. They're going to make a killing. They're now doing this thing called skinny plans, which essentially means that an insurance company says, we have a skinny plan, so what we'll do is we'll give you really a small amount of coverage for less money. Well, maybe it's a terrible plan and I don't get anything for it, but at least you're covered, at least you won't get fined. So, th you know, that's part of the problem with, with that system as well, is that we're creating a system where people are being forced to go to private insurance companies. Yes, sir. All right, he's distracted. <laughs> that's okay. I think so. I think part of it is they want to dumb it down um, to basically put you in a left-right paradigm. So dumb it down in this way. Um, Obamacare is either good and it's going to save the country or it's bad and it's going to destroy the country. So you got to pick a side. And, and, and neither of those is entirely true. It's not going to save the country and it's not going to destroy the country. But, but ultimately, what does it mean? What does Obamacare mean for you as an individual? And so what they're not talking to you about, and part of the reason for it is because I'm sure there are a lot of Republicans who also get a lot of lobbyist money coming from insurance companies. They're not going to piss off insurance companies by saying, hey, you know what, these guys are basically going to run a scam on the whole country. There's a guy I, I talked to who's a state legislator in Idaho who's also an insurance agent. Idaho attempted to pass a deal saying we will not sign up for an exchange, right? And he's an insurance agent, and he says insurance companies are going to make a killing on this thing. It's, it's best for them. They're thrilled about it because they have all these people who are being forced to sign up for it. So, you know, the, the debate about a single-payer system and all these, we can get into all that stuff, but at the end of the day, what it really comes down to is, again, you have private companies that are going to benefit because a law was passed that says you have to sign up for it. However, let me just say, too, if it sounds like I'm beating up on it, part of my beef with the way Republicans... And, and especially Republicans, but dem some Democrats too, have treated this issue, is that there are very legitimate issues with health care in this country. There are legitimate issues with health insurance in this country. There are legitimate issues about people being kicked off of health insurance or not being allowed to have insurance because of pre-existing conditions. And I have not heard one single reasonable proposal from any Republican in D.C. 
to say, here's how we deal with that problem. They're not, they don't even want to talk about that problem. So you would think, by listening to Republicans only, that essentially there is no problem with health care in America. And they, used to, they would go around saying that during the debate. debate there is no problem with health care. That's not true, because if there was no problem with health care, then we wouldn't be having this discussion. The only reason you get any traction for it at all is because there are people who say, I can't get it. And so they're, you know, people are suffering, but they're not, they're not working to fix that. There, there has not been yet. Eventually, that will probably come. Eventually, what you'll have to do is you'll probably have to move to what's called a single-payer system because you're going to have so many amounts uh, in different areas and you know, coverage is going to be all over the place and people are going to be struggling. And at some point, if it starts to fall apart, which it probably will because it's way too expensive, um, then you'll probably hear we need to move to a single-payer system, which means government will provide the insurance for everyone. And that's eventually what it will probably lead to. Let me go here real quick and then I'll get to you, okay? Yes. So if Obamacare is basically government power combined with insurance companies, then no Obamacare is attached. Well, I, w I would say that, uh, no, I would say that it is to an extent. I would. I would say that it is a form of fascism. But again, it, hear me when I say this, it's unfair to say Obamacare is fascism because the whole system in D.C. is fascism. So Obamacare is one very small part of an entire system of collusion between government and corporations. And, and, and so, you know, I could see the headline, right, like Obamacare is fascism. But you know what? We're, what we're seeing all throughout D.C. is fascism. And so on the right and on the left, I mean, just for instance, the idea when the Supreme Court, we talked about the Supreme Court earlier, ruled in Citizens United that these big corporations and political action committees can essentially pour tons of money into elections, that's also fascism. You're allowing these big corporations to help skew the outcome. I have no problem with corporations. I know I sound like I hate them. I don't. I don't have a problem with corporations. I have a problem with corporations developing special rules through lawmakers in order to enrich themselves at my expense. That's, that's where it comes from. Yes, sir. Go right ahead. Okay. You won't say anything about the economy, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I, I think that we need to reassess what the point of, of the news is, what journalism is, because we want to learn the, the intricate you know, mechanisms behind how markets work or how we should have government-funded programs. We should want to incentivize people to read about it themselves or learn on their own. Right. Do you think that's the best way. Um, I do. I think what, what news needs to return to, uh, maybe not return is not the right word because I'm not sure if they were ever there, but what we need to get to is we need to become a source of public education, meaning that we educate the public on particular areas of uh, economics and of foreign policy and of especially long-term effects. One thing that news organizations should have the ability to do is take a look, a snapshot, at 20 years of policy and what does it mean. And the problem is you can't do that through a left-right paradigm because you're, what you don't want to do is ever say that the other guys were doing it right or that the other guys were doing it wrong if your guy's doing the same thing. So what you want to do is you want to, you want to put everything into basically like a 30-day cycle or a two-year cycle and say, well, you know, this decision was made and so ultimately it means this. Um, and and they, they, they keep everything in, in a very um, kind of like narrow view. Uh, I think it's very difficult for people to absorb what's going on. So then what happens is that the general public regurgitates talking points, right? And a lot of those talking points come from political parties who send them over to news agencies who regurgitate p talking points, you know? And so you'll hear about, you know, foreign policy. You'll hear about Syria, for instance. Let's talk about Syria. We got the flag up behind me. People are going to think this is like a pro-Syria rally. In here. <laughs> walking past. What's going on in there? What are they talking about? So... So the, the deal with Syria, this is a fascinating case study because Syria is the one example where you actually had the left-right paradigm fall apart. Um, because you essentially had the left and the right saying the exact same thing about Syria, which was what? What did they tell us? 
bomb them. We have to do this. We have to go to war because a red line has been crossed and we have to intervene in Syria to protect the children. Right? So on the right, I mean, you got guys like Bill O'Reilly every night saying only the pinheads, the pinheads wouldn't do this, but only the nut jobs and the loons don't want to go. But it wasn't true. Now here's how it plays out. It all begins on a Wednesday when a chemical weapon is used in a suburb of Damascus. Okay? Oh, less than a week later, we've now got American warships lining up to in the Mediterranean to fire kinetic weapons on Damascus. Okay? Do you guys remember what week that was? Do you remember what, what weekend was on its way? Labor Day. Labor Day weekend was on its way. Why is that important? Because this is how governments, especially in the United States, how we conduct uh, the news cycle, right? Everything's built on the news cycle. So when, when a big story is going to happen that we don't want people to talk about, you release it on a Friday because no one's paying attention on Fridays. You release it on a holiday when really no one's paying attention. So the whole thing was basically set up like this. We're going to line up and, and place cruise missiles in position to strike Damascus. The president has the ability to do this whenever he's ready if he decides he's going to take action. And then Secretary of State John Kerry comes out and says, here's what we see happening in Syria right now. Chemical weapons were used. We know for a fact, he said, that what actually happened came from Assad. That the Assad regime used the chemical weapons. We know for a fact. Do you remember how we knew? Do you know how he came to that absolute conclusion? Somebody said movies? YouTube. YouTube videos. And that's not me saying it. That was him. Secretary of State John Kerry said the reason they came to this conclusion was watching the YouTube videos. They knew that those chemical weapons were used and that it was sarin gas and that it had to be Assad. What he didn't tell you, what CNN didn't tell you, what Fox News didn't tell you, was that while sarin gas may have been used, the group Al-Nusra Front, who is Al-Qaeda in Syria, was caught with two kilos of sarin gas by Turkish officials on May 31st. Secretary of State Kerry said the only entity in Syria that has um, sarin gas is the Assad regime. It was not true. While watching YouTube, he might have Googled and he would have seen that it was all over alternative media. Yeah. Interesting. RT had that? It's very possible. I mean, you, it's very difficult to use YouTube as a, as a source for um, factual anything. But um, so what we see is uh, the, the administration comes out and, and, you know, they're ready to go. Media is behind them 100 percent. It's guys, it's the exact same script, word for word, the same script that we saw in 2003 to go into Iraq. And what's crazy to me is some of you guys were pretty young when we went to Iraq. Um, it's 10 years ago, so some of you guys were like really pretty small. You're like watching like Nickelodeon then. Uh, but, but when we went to, into Iraq, um, it was the exact same script. The exact same things were said about, hey, listen, um, we've got weapons of mass destruction, and these people are you know, in danger, and we have to go. We have to intervene. And if we don't, then Al-Qaeda has a place where they will be able to grow and to flourish. That's what President Bush said in 2003. I don't know if you guys remember that or not. But what President Bush told us about Iraq was that we had to go because Al-Qaeda terrorists would use Iraq as a safe haven from which to operate. It was a complete lie. It might have been confusion on his part, but it wasn't true at all in terms of, any, of anything the U.S. government even knew at that time. Al-Qaeda did not operate with any kind of success in Iraq because Saddam Hussein hated Al-Qaeda. Do you know why he hated Al-Qaeda? They were a threat to his leadership. And what you guys really won't remember because you were really small and perhaps I fear to even say maybe not even born during the first Gulf War. How many of you guys were alive during the first Gulf War? Okay. Oof. Man. Now you're feeling old. So... 
The first Gulf War, the United States, you probably know, we went into Kuwait because Saddam Hussein had taken tanks into Kuwait and he was moving in, and so the U.S. came to intervene. Did you know that? Just say yes if you did. Okay. Did you know that at the time there was a guy in Afghanistan who had been given weapons by the United States in order to push the Soviets out of Afghanistan by the name of Osama bin Laden? Did you know that? Good. So Osama bin Laden is in Afghanistan, and he sees that Saddam Hussein is moved into Kuwait, who has a very comfy, friendly relationship with the government of Saudi Arabia and the royal family there. Okay? So Osama bin Laden, who, by the way, is from Saudi Arabia, um, contacts the royal family and says that he will come and he will drive the invaders from Iraq out of Kuwait. He will bring the Mujahideen to, to fight this holy war to push Saddam Hussein out. He hated Saddam Hussein. Hussein hated him. The Saudi royal family said, no, we don't need you. And instead, U.S. forces came in and pushed Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. That was the first Gulf War. Do you remember all those details? Did you know all of that? Good. Did you know that a few years later, when there was a, a very famous incident, you may have seen the movie called Black Hawk Down. Have you seen that? Black Hawk Down it was the story of a, uh, the U.S. sent this, they were, they were trying to take out um, leaders in Somalia uh, who were part of a Al-Qaeda group that essentially was, at the time, was working to um, prevent aid from getting to the people in Somalia. And so the U.S. found out that there was a group of these leaders all meeting together in the same building at the same time. Um, in fact, 60 Minutes just did something on this the other night, uh, if you guys saw that. They went in, and they essentially went in there to get these targets all at one time, and it, and it went off without a hitch. And then they got back into their helicopters, and they're taking off, and a RPG, a, a rocket-propelled grenade, um, was fired, and it hit the tail of one of those Black Hawk helicopters, and it brought it down into this uh, suburb area uh, in Somalia. And so um, immediately when that happened, like all these fighters started coming out of nowhere. And so these U.S. military guys are like trying to get back to the wreckage. And it's a crazy story. It's, it's an amazing story. Uh, and if you ever get a chance to rent the movie, check out the movie. It's, it's really interesting. What they don't tell you in that movie and what history hasn't really done a good job of telling us is why that group was growing in Somalia. It was growing because that was when, after the first Gulf War, Osama bin Laden began pushing this idea that America was a great evil and what we needed, that Al-Qaeda needed to lead a jihad against America. It came from the fact that the U.S., instead of loyal Muslim fighters, were allowed to push the Iraqis out of Kuwait. After the incident in Somalia, Al-Qaeda continued to grow in that region of the world, and then you know the rest of how we get to where we are today. Yes, sir. Say again. That's correct. That's correct. And the United States, after they, we, we went over there to Kuwait, we established bases throughout that area that are still there today. I mean, if you ever look at a map, have you ever looked at a map of U.S. bases in the Middle East and Africa? It's pretty incredible. It's incredible. Um, there's a pretty funny meme that says the reason uh, that we need to take out Iran is because they've got us surrounded, and then there's a picture of like all the U.S. bases like completely surrounding Iran. Uh, it's pretty incredible looking. But that's that's how we kind of got there. So the thing with Syria is that. We had the same buildup in 2003, and, and we were being told all these things about weapons of mass destruction, and we're being told all this stuff, and then none of it comes out to be true. Um, flash forward to 2013, and it's the exact same talking points, identical talking points. So similar, true story, so similar that CNN just pulled graphics from 2003 and replaced the name Iraq with Syria in order to run graphics on one of their newscasts. They got caught doing it. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's, it's mind-boggling that 10 years later we would do the exact same thing. The difference this time, though, was that the public as a whole didn't buy into it. Um, they didn't believe it. And so the difference was when everything was put into position, all of a sudden, 
Um, the public says no. 90% of the American people, I'm going to skip past some of these. We don't have the, uh, I'll show you this. We don't have the, the audio. It doesn't sound like it's coming through, but Winston Churchill once said, men occasionally will stumble over the truth, but most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing ever happened. That's kind of what happened uh, with, with Syria. I got to skip these because, like I said, the, the audio's not there. Love that guy, right? So this is some of the, the reporting that we were doing on August 25th about the fact that, okay, uh, the U.S. military had moved cruise missiles into position for a possible strike against Syrian government forces, right? This was all the setup. This was August 25th. Then we had John Kerry. I told you about this, August 27th. What we saw in Syria last week, he said, should shock the conscience of the world. It defies any code of morality. Let me be clear, he said, the indiscriminate slaughter of civilians, the killing of women and children and innocent bystanders by chemical weapons is a moral obscenity. By any standard, it is inexcusable. And despite the excuses and equivocations that some have manufactured, it is undeniable, says Secretary Kerry. So what happened? Well, two major polls came out showing the first one by Reuters, that only 9% of Americans supported U.S. intervention in Syria. The second poll conducted by NBC News found 79% of Americans, including 70% of Democrats and 90% of Republicans, said President Obama should be required to receive authority from Congress before taking any action against the Syrian regime for the suspected use of chemical weapons in the ongoing civil war. You know, what's fascinating about that is that every time we talk about going into any kind of uh, military intervention, as we call it, like we did in Libya. Um, rule of law essentially says this. A president has to have approval from Congress. A president cannot declare war. Now, some people say, well, no, wait a minute, excuse me, there's a thing called the War Powers Act of 1973. That's not what it says. The War Powers Act of 1973 says that in the event that the United States is facing imminent attack, a president can, for 30 days, engage in military action. He has 30 days in which to go back to Congress and get approval, and then something like 90 days to get everybody out of there. That's what the War Powers Act says. It does not say, for 30 days, you get a hall passed. Any place you want to go and bomb, have at it. You know, take it away. And after two weeks, you can say, yeah, okay, everybody, come on back, come back. It's like playing uh, uh, dodgeball. Everybody runs up to the line, like, hit as many people as you can, and then run back. Oh, okay, we're good. It does not say that. So, but we have this, this ongoing fight. Since World War II, we have not had a properly declared war in the United States. But Congress doesn't care. See, Congress will play this game and say, well, the president better get approval before he goes over there. That's what they'll say. Then they find out the president says, well, 90% of the people don't want to go. They don't want to look bad. So he says, hey, you know what? Congress should vote on this. He actually gave it back to Congress. Said, said, I can still do it if I want to. If I want to. But... It's yours, Congress. And Congress was like, oh, we don't want this. Don't give it to us because we're not going to vote on it. John Boehner actually said the president should hurry up and go to war and strike Syria before they had a chance to vote on it. He didn't want to take it to a vote. In fact, he says this. The National Review Online reported that congressional aides said that how the House may not even vote on action in Syria if House leadership believes the vote will fail. Two new whip counts of House members by ABC News and the liberal Fire Dog Lake website show a majority of House members firmly or leaning against intervention. The Washington Post's more conservative count stands at 204, no votes, only 13 short of the majority needed to kill the president's request. That was on September 6th. Congress didn't want to go, didn't want to vote, didn't want to talk about it. Why not? Why not take a vote and say, how many of you want to go to war again? And how many of you want to use kinetic weapons to answer what happened with chemical weapons? See, here's the problem with what we were saying, the left-right paradigm. The answer from, from government is always, well, we have a problem, we need to blow it up. All right? It's like the, the crazy husband who's like, you know, everything is with gasoline in his house. I'm going to clean with gasoline. And we got a wasp nest. I'm going to douse it with gasoline. I mean, it's like the same answer to everything. And so what we find in, in Washington is that you get people who are in government positions and their answer anytime there's a problem is, well, we need to bomb somebody to make sure they understand that we're in charge. But this, Absolutely. And, I, and, and General Wesley Clark has talked a lot about this strategy. Ultimately, you're talking about the strategy ultimately to get Iran um, and to... 
Mm -hmm. is to dominate the uh, supply chain. Right. So, I mean, do you feel as a journalist that it's your responsibility to take the news down to at face value? Or would you like to, uh, you know, go into a horse and cart so you can dive into the story? Right. I, I think that we, we should never take it at face value. Um, and I think when you do have someone like Wesley Clark, who, General Wesley Clark, who is, who is saying there is a bigger, a bigger picture here, and this is what they're really trying to do. Look, if you just sit back and watch what has happened around the world, um, especially since September 11th, and all the countries that we've gone into, all the places where there's been intervention, um, the way that the U.S. is conducting foreign policy right now, you know, on many levels, doesn't make any sense at all. Well, I guess it makes perfect sense if, if, that, if, if Clark is right about the strategy. But if he's not, if you just take what these guys are saying at face value, it doesn't make any sense at all. Absolutely. You know, if you, if you look at what happens in Syria, there is no question, and we've done a lot of reporting on this, there is no question that the guys in Syria um, who are supposed to be the opposition, the rebel fighters, are not Syrian rebels. They're not. They, these guys are called al-Nusra Front. They are, most of them are fighters from Iraq and from Libya who have come into Syria and they're trying to overthrow the government there. There's no question that Israel's a big part of that strategy um, and the U.S. together, but they, we do this all the time. I mean, Libya, how many of you guys know that in Libya, when we went in there, it was all supposed to be to stop one village from being massacred? That was why we intervened. And then we stayed. Well, as long as we show up for an intervention and we stay for a bombing party and we enforce a no-fly zone and then we say, well, we just keep bombing until we eventually kill the president of the country because the convoy, when Gaddafi was finally caught that we bombed, that was bombed by the U.S. They were searching actively for Gaddafi and they got him. And there's a, there's a lot of talk about that too. It's simply the fact that, that Gaddafi had stored up all this gold and wanted to move the, the sell of oil around the world, away from dollars, and to uh, the African dinar. Didn't uh, Libya have a higher standard of living of uh, any country in North Africa? That's correct. Correct. Yeah. It's pretty incredible when you, when you consider that. And again, you've got to talk about big picture, though. If you say to the average person that Libya wanted to move away from the dollar in order to sell oil and they wanted to sell it in gold, and you say, well, so? Let them do it. The reason that's important is because the United States dollar is not back to anything, but it is tied to petroleum. So every barrel of oil produced around the world and sold is sold in the U.S. dollar. If it's sold in Russia, it's sold in dollars. If it's sold in China, it's sold in dollars. Chinese are changing that right now. They're actively changing that. The Chinese are building the world's largest refinery in Saudi Arabia right now. Um, they already have deals with Russia to not sell in dollars. They have a deal with Venezuela to not sell in dollars. They're actually doing an, with Iran what's called a junk for oils trade because of the, the um, um, what's it called, the sanctions against Iran. You can't, you can't trade with them uh, through, through the correct marketplaces. So instead it's called junk for oil. Basically we'll give you wheat and we'll give you stuff and you give, give us oil. And so they're building these relationships all over the world. And friend, if I tell you anything tonight, understand this, that the biggest story that no media is talking to you about is the fact that the dollar is barely hanging on to its connection to petroleum. And when that changes, and it will change, we're all going to be screwed. This country is screwed. It, it is. It is. The entire economy of the United States will collapse when that happens. And, it is, and it's not like crazy conspiracy stuff. I mean, you can Google search this stuff in about 10 seconds and find out that, yeah, the Chinese are doing this, and yes, uh, petroleum is what we're tied to, and yes, if we stop trading uh, oil in dollars, we're in a lot of trouble. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then you have the Democrats who like Obama who aren't going to 
terrorists stop him, and so he can successfully go to war. If Romney had become president, ironically enough, despite his war drums against Iran, uh, at least one side would have been against him, and that's the Democrats, because the Democrats don't like Romney. Right. So now we're stuck in this situation with Obama. Now we can debate his other merits, but in this situation at least, neither side Well, and that's and that's that's very true. I think you know one of the, the things about President Obama is that there is. Listen, if you're a Republican, you should really appreciate him, and especially what he does in foreign policy. Because if you have a Republican, a typical Republican view of foreign policy, he is one of the best uh, foreign policy presidents that this country's ever had. You cannot sit there and say, well, he's. He, and, and by the way, I got to interview Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan, you know, during the the election. And Paul Ryan kept talking about how the president was making us look weak around the world. And I'm like, what are you talking about, weak? I mean, every, I, I asked him specifically, tell me one thing specifically that, that a Romney-Ryan presidency would do on foreign policy that this president is not doing. Just give me one. He couldn't give me one. He would say, well, we, just, we, we, we would improve the relationship around the world. People would like us better. We'd, we'd look stronger. You wouldn't look stronger. I'm sorry, but in most countries around the world, uh, President Obama is not just seen as strong, he's seen as, as cruel. I mean, if you go into Yemen, do you think people in Yemen think he's a weak president? I guarantee you they don't. We're drone striking that country into an oblivion. We're just lighting up villages all over the place. In Somalia, you think they think he's weak? No way. Because U.S. foreign policy under, under this president has intensified greatly. So if, if you're a, you know, the, the left-right paradigm breaks down, and by the way, this is one reason that Romney during the, the election would not talk about uh, foreign policy. He gave the first Republican uh, convention speech, uh, nomination acceptance speech, in recent modern history where nothing was said about troops or war. Didn't say anything about him. Imagine a Republican doing that. Yeah. The, the, the term neocon, right, which means new conservatives, what George Bush called himself, Dick Cheney called himself, I mean, that's not a slur against them. That's what they called themselves. They were neocons, right, were the new conservatives. Um, you, could, you could argue, I think, pretty strongly, if, again, if you break down the partisan walls, that President Obama is, is a better neocon president than Bush ever was. Um, because of because of the things that neocons see as being great attributes, when they say, "Hey, I think that you know we need to have this very strong foreign policy, and we need to go after the terrorists wherever they are," okay, but he's done that. He's done that better than Bush ever did. So now, if you think, "Hey, we shouldn't be drone striking in those countries," which a lot of progressives believe, and it's and when when Bush was doing it, they didn't like it, and he didn't do it near to the extent that Obama has. Um, if you say, "You know, we don't like those things, we need to end that." then you shouldn't support what this president's doing over there. But if you like it for one guy, then how can you be critical of, of this president for doing it? I, I, that's where the paradigm really frustrates me. Yeah. You know, I, I wish I could tell you the why, and I don't know. I, I don't. What do you think? And I know, and I know this. I know that, like for instance, with some foreign governments. So, um, have you guys ever heard of a, a reporter named Amber Lyon? Have you heard that name? Amber Lyon is a, a young lady who worked for CNN for some time, um, and she says she she did a lot of reporting on atrocities being committed by the government of Bahrain, and she says that CNN was paid by the government of Bahrain not to run stories on it, and they killed all of her reporting. Like, we're not going to do it. We're not going to run it. Um, 
you know, you have, you have groups out there like Al Jazeera now, they have their own, own network. And by the way, do, they do some really good work, really good reporting. Um, but when you watch them, you have to understand that they have a point of view, and that point of view is whatever the government of Qatar wants to come across. So what you're probably not gonna see is when the government of Qatar is funding rebels in Syria, Al Jazeera is probably not gonna lead the charge in reporting about the fact that Al Qaeda is actually the uh, Syrian rebels. They're just not going to talk about it. So you have to understand that RT is the same way. RT does great reporting. They do some really good stuff, uh, but they're funded by the Kremlin. And so they have a point of view. But, but our networks all have a point of view also. Yep. Yeah, so, so what it is is it's essentially um, – what's called a shield law. So a shield law basically says, if, if Edward Snowden comes to me, okay, and says, hey, I wanna tell you about what's going on with the NSA, they're reading everybody's emails and they're you know, reading their text messages. And he says, I, wanna, I want you to report on it. So he tells me his story, he gives me all his information, but says, I wanna remain anonymous. I don't want anyone to know it's me, right? And so I take all this information from him and I run a story about it. And then the next day, the FBI or you know, whoever else, um, Homeland Security, DHS, whatever, show up at my house and say, hey, we want to talk to you about this story that you just put out and you're putting out all these secrets and somebody's leaking this to you. So you need to tell us who your source is. Right, right. and I'm like, no, I'm not going to tell you who the source is. They say, well, okay, well, then we're going to throw you in jail until you tell us who your source is. And then I go before a judge at some point and the judge says, hey, I want to know what you, who, your, who your source is. And I say, I'm not going to tell you who my source is. And they say, well, then we're going we're to keep you locked up until you do. A shield law essentially says that as a journalist, you have the right under the First Amendment to be able to provide this information to the public. And, and therefore, um, if the Edward Snowden comes to me and tells me, as a journalist, I can say, no, nope, because I'm a journalist and I have the right to not share this information. And so I'm able to do that. Um, so as the shield law was being kind of worked through the process, you be, there, a debate began to happen within the Senate, specifically Dianne Feinstein, Chuck Schumer, uh, a few of these guys who sat down and said, okay, well, so what constitutes a journalist? How do we decide who a journalist actually is and who they aren't? And so what they started talking about was the definition based upon um, certain rules and etiquette. At first, they decided that the only people who were considered journalists are people who work for corporations who produce media. That was the original definition. Well, then, of course, a bunch of journalists went nuts and said, wait a minute, that's crazy. You can't say that if I, only if I work for the New York Times or ABC News that I'm a journalist. And there's tons of journalists out there. And so then they expanded it a little bit to, okay, well, it, it'll include student journalists as well, and it'll include some citizen journalists. Dianne Feinstein's words were, however, if some 17-year-old decides to go online and start their own blog and decides to release information, I can't give them that privilege. Now, those were her words. Consider what she said. I can't give them that privilege. The freedom of press in this country is not a privilege. It is a First Amendment right. So when, when government starts trying to define who counts as a journalist and who doesn't, they're essentially saying, we're going to give clearance to certain people to be able to talk about these issues. Where does the Fifth Amendment fit into that? Well, well, that's an interesting thing, too, because uh, there is an issue as well um, where even throughout all this definition, it all breaks down anyways into, but, they leave a big, big open space, but anything that government decides violates national security, you're not protected anyways. Was that NDAA? Or nope, nope. It, it didn't go back to NDAA at all. It was, it, this is just their kind of, their definition. Yeah. And so they, they've come back and said now that, well, you know, so essentially we're giving ourselves an out. So basically anything you report and we decide that it's national security, then you don't get protection. And so we can make you talk about it. It's kind of where we are right now. It's, it's a very weird time. When we talk about national security and protecting privacy and your right and to, to know information and my right to give you information, I mean, it's all very quickly disappearing. And a lot of that goes back to 2001. It goes back to the Patriot Act. It goes back to this idea that after September 11th, we decided that we needed to trade freedom and liberty for security. We need to be safe from the bad guys. We were so convinced that the bad guys were going to get us. And so people just stood back and, and let government take all this individual freedom from them. And now that it's gone, how do you get it back? You know, the whole NSA 
controversy, guys, it all comes from the idea that the feds through the NSA were taking authority they didn't have under the Patriot Act. James Sensenbrenner, who's a Republican uh, congressman who wrote the Patriot Act, said about the NSA scandal, said we had no idea that what we had passed in the Patriot Act would be abused this way. Really? You had no idea that if you handed a blank check to government agencies and said, get bad guys no matter what, that they weren't going to run afoul with it? Of course they were. It's the nature of government. It's not that government's evil. It's that when you give people authority and power, they use it. And people are flawed. So some people abuse it. Some people take more than they, than they deserve, and they use it in terrible ways. And it happens. And that's why the, the less power you give to those folks, the safer you are. It was. He, I don't think he ever said he would repeal the Patriot Act. Um, in fact, I think it's the opposite. I think he voted for it when he was in the Senate, for, when it came up again, um, and he's continued to keep it in place. He's talked about other things, but, but the Patriot Act he has, he has always uh, stood with. And, and I think most Americans still like it. I mean, one of, the, one of the problems with the Patriot Act, guys, is that there's a lot of stuff in there that's just untrue. There are claims that were made during the the Republican debates that the Patriot Act has actually prevented uh, huge numbers of terror attacks. When, when you say again, well, because they don't give you much information, first of all, right? But it's like, but they give you some examples of like cases where they've actually stopped like terror attacks. But that's what it comes down to. That's what the NSA. Mm -hmm. Right. The NSA originally said they had 50, and then they said maybe two, but they still haven't provided the two cases. Yeah, they didn't approve it. They didn't approve it. On the Boston bombing, is that what you said? Well, and that's the thing, is, is I don't think you should expect that government can stop everything. If somebody wants to commit a crime or do something evil, they're going to have the ability to do it. So you can't expect government to be able to stop everything from happening. The problem is, a lot of what we've seen since 2001 was that the FBI, under the Bush administration, began this big push, right? Because the FBI wanted to stop terrorists. And so what they started doing is they started creating terrorists in order to stop them. So there are several cases. I'll give you an example out of New York. There was a case in New York of these seven guys who were picked up by the FBI. Uh, they were black guys who were, I think they were kind of like quasi-Muslim, but not really. Um, and they were homeless at the time. The seven guys were homeless, okay? You heard about this? It's crazy. So the FBI has a guy who recruits them and says what he wants them to do is to help them bomb a Jewish synagogue in the Bronx. And they were going to get paid something like ten to 20000 I can't remember the exact number. It was like ten dollars to $20,000 cash each to do this. So don't, and it's always this way with these deals. Don't worry about having the weapons. I'll get the bombs. I'll provide all the stuff. All you guys have to do is show up. So they get these seven guys to show up, and then they arrest them, and then they have a press release. The public was never in danger at any time. Yes, no kidding the public was never in danger, because these guys weren't terrorists. They were seven homeless guys who you convinced to do this for money, and then you busted them. And the judge, the federal judge who has to sentence these guys, because it's mandatory sentencing, says in the sentencing, the only crime here was birthed in the mind of the FBI. It was never in the minds of these guys. It's not. I thought it was too. And we actually did some reporting on this because my first thought was it has to be entrapment, right? But it's not because the way the legal definition for entrapment works is this. Entrapment means that, that the crime committed um, does, or the crime that was created didn't have to be first created in my mind. Okay? So your thought is entrapment, if I come up to you and say, hey, we should go over there and we should set fire to that room and then it'll be funny and we'll get out of here, right? And if I tell you that and you're like, this is a terrible idea, this is a terrible idea, and I drag you by the hand in there and I light the match and then we do it and then we run out of the room and you get caught as we're running out, that's entrapment. What's not entrapment is if I say, hey, we should burn down that room and you're like, yeah, that's a good idea, you know, and we could use like this, this gasoline that they keep over here, oh, now it's not entrapment anymore. Because as long as I get you to commit some thought of your own into that crime, it's no longer entrapment under the legal definition, which is BS. 
I mean, it's ridiculous that I can come to you as an FBI informant or agent and I can plant the seed of this crime in your mind. I can tell you this is something that you should do. I'll provide the weapons. I'll provide the bombs. I'll come up with exactly the strategy, the time, the place, everything. You just be here at this time. And then when you do, we arrest you and say, oh, well, we certainly made ourselves safer. So, you know, that's, that's essentially what, what it comes down to. And that's the problem with what we've seen with a lot of the Patriot Act, is the ability to basically turn around and, and to take um, concepts and, and ideas that we're somehow protecting the country uh, by creating uh, these, you know, laws. What, all we're really doing is creating crimes in order to stop them. So let me just wrap up with this, guys, because I kind of kind of wrap up here. I was given a note to say, stop talking. Uh, <laughs> Here's what I, what, I wanted to, what I want to share with you, though, before we go. And that is that as we're talking about the left-right paradigm, um, what can you guys do practically? What can you practically do in order to make some, some changes? And the first part of it is this. I, I would, first of all, I'd say join YAL, right? Or join uh, UIM. Get a part, be a part of this movement uh, of young people who are saying, you know what, we need to think, we need to think past the paradigm. Okay? Stop believing that it makes you informed to regurgitate talking points that you're hearing on TV, because it doesn't. Be a critical thinker. Challenge the ideas that you're hearing. Don't just, don't just assume, well, I, listen, one of the games the media is gonna always play with you is they're always gonna say, it's better to be like me than it is to be like them. It's what they're gonna do to you. It's what we did during the election, right? You realize that in this, this last election, that four million fewer Republicans voted for Mitt Romney than even voted for John McCain. Because media kept telling them, no, 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 it's either vote for Romney or you're gonna get Obama, because if you don't vote for him, you're actually voting for Obama. That's what you're really doing. It's a, it's a vote for Obama. And so it wasn't about, hey, vote for this guy because you believe in him. It was don't vote for that guy, so vote for my guy. And then on the other side, President Obama received seven million fewer votes than he did the first time around. Now, I don't want you guys to believe that any one person is the problem with what we see in our country today. So when you hear someone who ignorantly says, well, it's all Obama, we could just get rid of Obama, that person's a fool. If they really believe that if you would replace this president that everything's going to be fixed in this country, they're, kid they're kidding themselves and they're watching too much Fox. That's the problem they run into. If, if the person tells you, no, you know what, as long as Obama's there, everything's gonna be okay, because it could, it could always just be much worse, and, and he's gonna keep us from going completely off the edge. It's just not true. It's not true. Here's what I think. I think that at the end of the day, what we have to do is we have to start working to build coalitions of people, student groups and journalists and, and Tea Party folks who have justified anger, not the ones who don't know what they're talking about. But there are some smart people in, in the Tea Party movement who have justified complaints. And there are some smart people in the Occupy movement who have some justified complaints. What we have to do is start finding reasonable, rational people and having the conversation that the media is not having. Why are things broken? Not who is breaking them. That's the question they're going to keep you asking. Change out this guy. Replace this guy. Get this woman. That'll fix your problem. It won't fix your problem. The problem that we have today is that you no longer have a voice. So until we restore your voice, your ability to be actually represented in a representative form of government, we don't fix anything. That's where the change will happen. I don't have to agree with everything you want for your life. And you don't have to agree with anything I want for my life. When I say liberty is rising, what I'm really trying to say is that the idea that you should be able to live your life and I should be able to live mine that is growing in America. That is the idea that we need to promote. That as individuals, we don't have to agree. We don't even have to like each other. But we should at least respect that the other person has a point of view. The other person has, has an interest for their life, a belief for their life, a desire for their life, and I should support your desire to have it. Stay away from people who start trying to turn politics into, well, we need to get control of the White House or Congress or the Senate or the Supreme Court so that we can stop these people. There's way too much of that in politics today. 
way too much idea that you need to be able to get power so that you can have control. The beautiful idea of liberty is that I want the power to leave you alone. I hope that you want your power for the same reason. Thank you, guys.